This condition is a primary cause of death, said University, has this to say. Every year, 50,000 people die needlessly because of asphyxia that could have been prevented. These lives can be saved if proper resuscitation methods are used. Asphyxia is a condition caused by lack of oxygen and an excess of carbon dioxide in the body. Without oxygen, the brain dies within three to five minutes and the heart soon stops beating. Asphyxia is associated by most people with drowning or smoke or gas inhalation. Yet actually, it may accompany any accident causing unconsciousness. Electric shock, poisoning, injuries to the head, neck, chest, or abdomen. It may even be caused by convulsions, cardiac arrest, or obstruction of the air passageway. Yet most victims of asphyxia could be revived if sufficient air could be gotten into their lungs without delay. This diagram shows what happens in normal breathing. An average conscious adult, quietly, inhales about one pint or 500 cubic centimeters of air per breath. In an unconscious person, the neck usually bends forward and the jaw sags. This tends to push the tongue over the air passageway and block it. Asphyxia develops because less and less air can get through to the lungs. The average adult cannot survive with less than one. When obstruction of the air passageway is complete, breathing efforts and heart action stop within a few minutes. This can happen regardless of whether the victim is on his back or on his stomach. Until now, the methods of artificial respiration used to relieve this condition were, for the most part, manual push-pull methods, such as the Schaefer method, the Sylvester method, the Holger-Nielsen method. Recent medical research, supported by the Surgeon General of the United States Army, has demonstrated three areas in which these manual methods are deficient. First, they tend to produce obstruction of the upper air passageway by the tongue so that little or no air can enter the lungs. Second, even when obstruction is not present, the manual methods may still not move sufficient volumes of air to revive the victim. You will notice that the average amounts of air moved by these methods is below the critical level. And third, because of his position in relation to the victim, the rescuer has no way of knowing whether or not his efforts are moving air through the victim's nose and mouth. On the basis of a review of available data, including the records of actual revival of victims in emergencies, the National Research Council, the United States Armed Forces, and most medical authorities now recognize that artificial respiration with the rescuer's own breath, or exuscitation. With exhaled air resuscitation, the rescuer can maintain an open air passageway by tilting the head backward and pulling the jaw forward. And he can move an average of three pints of air per breath into the victim's lungs. As a matter of fact, this method is not new. In the Bible, in the Book of Kings, the prophet Elisha, attempting to revive an apparently dead child, quote, put his mouth upon his mouth, and the child revived. Here is how you can perform life-saving artificial respiration with your own breath. This man could have been the victim of any type of accident. He is conscious. His breathing has stopped. He will die within minutes unless prompt and effective rescue breathing is begun at once. Place the victim on his back, face up. Approach his head from the left. Clean his throat only if necessary by forcing the mouth open and wiping the throat clean with your fingers or a piece of cloth. Tilt his head back into the chin-up position. Grasp his lower jaw with both hands just in front of the earlobes and hold it forcefully upward. The lower teeth must be in front of the upper teeth and the front of the neck must be stretched. If the mouth is closed, 
Hold it open by pushing the lower lip gently toward the chin with your thumbs. Never let the chin sag as this causes blockage of the air passageway. Take a deep breath. Cover the victim's entire mouth with your mouth to make airtight contact and blow. Press your right cheek against the victim's nose to prevent air leakage. Blow forcefully into an adult, gently into a duck. Watch the chest. When the chest rises, take your mouth off and let the victim exhale by himself. When he is finished exhaling, blow in the next deep breath. Repeat inflations every two to five seconds. Same procedure, but with these differences. In a child, breathe into the mouth and nose and blow gently. In a baby, do not blow, but use puffs from your cheek method. Here is an alternate method. Insert the thumb of your left hand between the victim's teeth. Grasp the lower jaw and hold it upward forcefully. Pinch his nostrils with your right hand. Take a deep breath and place your mouth tightly over his mouth and your own thumb. And then proceed in the manner already described. Direct mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing is effective because it gets adequate amounts of air into the victim's lungs and is always available. However, as a result of experiments conducted at the Department of Anesthesiology, Baltimore City Hospitals, under the auspices of the Surgeon General, United States Army, a device called the Resuscitube Airway was developed. It is made of plastic. It provides a mouthpiece for the rescuer, a breathing tube for the victim, and a flange to prevent air leakage. For adults, insert the long end into the victim's mouth. For children over two years of age, invert the flange and insert the short end. This is the pediatric size for children under two. The resuscitube makes mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing more effective and easier to perform. It prevents obstruction by the lips and teeth and holds the tongue forward. Now watch how the resuscitube is used to revive an unconscious, non-breathing victim. Place him on his back, face up. Tilt his head backward as far as you can. If you feel no breathing through mouth or nose, force his mouth open with your thumb and index finger crossed. If you have difficulty forcing the mouth open, insert your index finger between cheek and teeth and wedge it between the jaws behind the back teeth. Hold the resuscitube so that your mouthpiece curves back toward you. Insert the other end over the tongue. Do not push the tongue back into the throat. If necessary, hold the tongue forward with your finger during insertion. The flange should be cupped over his mouth. Pinch his nose with your thumbs. Press the flange over his mouth with your index fingers to prevent air leakage. And pull the chin up and toward yourself so that his head is tilted backward. Take a deep breath and blow into the mouthpiece of the resuscitator. Watch the victim's chest at all times. Blow very forcefully into an adult. Blow gently into a child. When his chest rises off, and let him exhale by himself. Repeat the inflations every two to five seconds. Again, timing and rhythm are not important. If the chest does not rise, readjust the position of the tube. Increase the chin-up position, press more firmly on the flange, and blow more forcefully. If the chest still does not rise, remove the tube and check for foreign matter. Make sure the tube is clear and reinsert it. If you notice the stomach bulging because of air blown into it, press on it. If vomiting occurs, clear throat quickly. When the unconscious victim begins shallow breathing, blow in your breath at the moment he inhales and take your mouth off the resuscitube quickly when he exhales so as not to interfere with his natural breathing.
When he is breathing and you are transporting him, elevate his shoulders so his head is tilted backward and leave the resuscitube in place. Be prepared to blow into the mouthpiece if he should stop breathing. For when the victim reacts by gagging or retching, remove the airway to prevent vomiting. Keep the head tilted backward to make sure that the air passageway is open. There are many cases where an unconscious person may still be breathing. Unconsciousness alone may kill by air passageway obstruction. Very frequently, this type of asphyxia can be prevented just by tilting the head backward. You must maintain the victim's head and jaw in this position until he regains consciousness. If this is not effective, insert the short end of the resuscitube. Use the short end of the tube to prevent gagging when the jaw is tight or the victim is partially conscious. Here are some important points to remember about drowning. You must get air into the victim's lungs without delay. Do not worry about water in the lungs. Often the drowning victim vomits water and food during resuscitation. If this should happen in an adult or large child, interrupt rescue breathing at once. Turn the victim's head to the side, clean the mouth and throat swiftly, and resume artificial respiration immediately. If vomiting occurs in a small child and two rescuers are present, one holds the child upside down while the other cleans the mouth and throat quickly. Remember, any type of accident causing unconsciousness may result in asphyxia. A non-breathing person will die in a very few minutes if air is not gotten into his lungs quickly. Practice the methods of exhaled air resuscitation you have just seen. In the mouth to airway method, insert the short end for practice purposes. In an emergency, if the resuscitube airway is not immediately available, do not waste valuable time looking for one. Start direct mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing at once. Every year, 50 